In this video, I walk you through how to use color pencil on Pastel Mat by Claire Fontaine. I'm drawing three field pumpkins, and if you would like this reference to follow along and draw from yourself, you're welcome to do that. I'll have a link in the video description for you to go over to the article where I have a downloadable ready for you over there to download the reference so you can try your hand at it as well. That'd be awesome. You can buy the paper either in individual sheets or in pads. This particular pad that I'm showing here comes in four different colors. There's 12 sheets in the entire pad, and they call it a uh, card for pastel. So it is actually marketed for pastelists. But don't let that dissuade you from using color pencil on this particular surface. It is so nice. There are several advantages that it has over uh, some of the other non-absorbent surfaces. So if we think of like some sanded paper, um, that would be a non-absorbent surface. But, uh, and I'll discuss those briefly, but the biggest one is that you don't have to worry about erasing a whole lot. Why? Because you can go ahead and change what the surface will look like because you can add lighter colors over darker colors. You can shift things back in a different direction. You can actually even take a harder lead pencil and push up some of the subsequent layers that you've already laid down. Now just look at how nice that yellow color is uh, showing up on this very, very dark surface. All right, so the colors that come in this particular pad that I'm demonstrating on right here is white, sienna, brown, and anthracite. Uh, now the anthracite's the one I'm using currently there. On the project we're going to show today though, uh, I'm using a much bigger sheet, very large. I think it's uh, 12 inches in one direction if I did the centimeter conversion correctly. So I'm sketching out my pumpkins on a white paper. I'm using the white in this case. And I like the call erase by Prismacolors for the sketch only. Typically that's what I'll use because, and I do not use the pink eraser uh, on the end of the pencil. Now on a non-absorbent surface like pastel matte, you don't have to worry about um, being able to erase. You can erase if you want to. It's easy to erase. And you don't have to use the call erase pencils. I typically will use those on Stonehenge or something like that with that ability to erase and it just comes in very handy. But on pastel mat, like I alluded to earlier, I don't have to worry about erasing. I can just make darker marks in a different spot if I need to. I'm not going to use the pink eraser. I'm going to use my needed eraser if I need to erase. But moving along in the project, once you get your line drawing in there, then you can start to add uh, your colors. And the beautiful thing, again, about using this pastel mat is the ability to uh, go ahead and shift the color direction and uh, even the values in a different direction than what you have down. So say you added too much of the stem. You got too much green in there. You can add yellow on top of that and you can dig up some of the darker colors with lighter colors even and yes you can dig into uh, the layers of pencil and so you could potentially damage the surface just a little bit if you dug into it too hard but for the most part um, with a little bit of practice you can control the amount of pressure that you're applying to the surface and it does take uh, it can take a lot of pressure so you don't have to worry about building up a lot of soft, light layers very, uh, you know, with a, a very soft touch or very light touch. But you can go ahead and use light to medium pressure in the beginning and increase that pressure over time to where you've got some pretty hard pressure. You can even go so far as to uh, burnish on this particular surface. Some, I, I've noticed, uh, do not care for um, uh, an airy kind of look, a look where you've uh, not gone so far as to get rid of all the tooth and you're showing some of the tooth. I know that bothers some artists. It doesn't really bother me a whole lot. But if that is something that bothers you, then, you know, you can go ahead and just keep adding more layers to that point where 
you have burnished and you have a, a total saturation kind of look. It works well doing it that way, but it also works well the other way where you are showing a little bit of the white of the paper underneath. It's such a consistent tooth that it's not going to be uh, distracting at all to the viewer. So it's a very thin tooth, very thin layer of this cellulose, but it's uh, distributed so evenly that you don't have to worry about the way that it appears and the way that it looks. It's a very consistent look and feel. Once in a while on a real smooth surface or uh, a surface that has a very spongy or soft uh, uh, tooth, like Stonehenge in particular, you'll get some, uh, some types of marks on there that you didn't intend to make and a little bit of scoring on the paper that you're having to fight with. But on this paper, I've not ever run into that so far. Uh, I had one time where I did press too hard in a particular area, uh, and so I scored the paper a little bit that way, but it was not a problem to get around that issue at all. Uh, I just um, I was just able to add more pencil layers in that area and build up the pigment layers um, by adding more pencil layers. It was not a problem. So I'm establishing all of my shadows using more of a red color when I'm doing that. Uh, Caput Mortem is one in particular that I'm trying to uh, use quite a bit in the deepest recessed areas of the shadow. Establishing just some of the pumpkins here and the gourds and get some of the highlights in here where I need them. Getting a little bit of a suggestion of some of the local color, the orange for the pumpkin. And I'm going to go ahead and fully render out that first pumpkin and before I move on to other parts of the drawing. I want these pumpkins to look slightly different from each other. And one way, good way to do that is to just use different pencils or vary uh, the layering process. One of the key differences in using pastel mat over uh, a lot of other surfaces, one of the big advantages is the use of solvent. You are essentially just painting on the surface. A little solvent goes a long way, but a lot of solvent um, makes it just such a, a nice painterly kind of experience on pastel mat. And there's really no other surface that I've found so far that compares to what you get with uh, using solvent on this particular surface. It, it's just unlike anything else. Um, it will run. It, it makes it very, very fluid. You can move everything around. Yet at the same time, once you allow it to dry, and you don't have to wait for it to dry, you can go ahead and start applying some light layers of pencil on top of it, even while it's wet. But one of the nice advantages is if you allow it to dry, you can come back on top of it and then move everything in a different direction. Say you got it too dark in certain areas, then you can go over that area with your lighter pencils and it will influence uh, the look of your composition very nicely. All right, building up that uh, pumpkin there and just go floating back and forth between yellows and reds and oranges. And I'm thinking about that local color the entire time. So I'm thinking about what that predominant hue is. That's what I mean by the local color. Somebody looks at this object. They look at this subject matter, the pumpkin. What, what do they say it is? What color is it? It's orange. And I want to make sure that I convey that. I don't want it to look like it's, you know, a thousand different colors. I want to make sure that there's a predominant hue that is very obvious when someone looks at it. I really love using that ivory pencil by Polychromos. It just pushes everything into this lighter direction, especially with an orange color. Uh, any of these earthy kind of colors where you've got some greens and reds and yellows and oranges. If you just take your ivory pencil with Polychromos, there are some other very similar pencils you could use as well. And you push that uh, just a little bit on the top surface level there, you can push it back into a lighter direction. Buff Titanium is another good one in the Luminance brand. 
to use, and it'll do essentially the same thing. You're leaning your composition in a lighter direction. Champagne uh, by the Derwent Lightfast brand is also a good one to use. So the point is to just lean it back in a lighter direction. That's what I want to do. So I'm getting, I'm using my ruler to get that horizon line in here. I, this is a landscape. I need a very straight uh, horizon line. So if I can't do that by, um, you know, looking at it and, and just figuring it out, um, it, it's not a bad approach to measure from the top down or from the bottom up making sure that's very square. Otherwise, you're going to make people feel a little uneasy if this is framed on a wall uh, and they're looking at it and you've got that horizon line crooked. Uh, it can start to make you feel a little seasick. So I want to make sure that's very straight. Using uh, a very, very dark pencil for the tree trunks back here and the branches on those trees way far away. Just adding in some visual interest uh, and I want that sort of out-of-focus effect in the background there. I'm trying to emulate a 50 millimeter lens on a camera, and so I'm allowing it to be out of focus in the back. So by definition, I don't want more detail in the back. I want less detail. So use that overhand uh, hold on the pencil will allow you to loosen up just a little bit. Putting in some blue and purples for some hills in the background. Now, I'm just making up the background. You can um, choose to not do a background or do a very elaborate background if you want to. But I wanted there to be some sort of depth and dimension in the piece. That's why I'm doing that. Adding a little suggestion of some blue for the sky. I'm not going to make a big deal out of the sky. I'm just going to add a, a tint of color, a little bit of hint of some color back there. And I want it uh, more of a pinkish kind of color towards the center of the composition. So if I do some outlines back there around the trees, that will uh, give me sort of that 50 millimeter uh, effect. Especially if you're looking at this across the room. Far right, I've got a tree over there using olive green by the Derwent drawing line. I'm using a whole bunch of different pencils in this particular composition. Derwent Lightfast, Polychromos by Faber-Castell using Luminance by Carindosh, and the Derwent drawing pencils, which are excellent pencils. Getting some of this grass in here. I want this to uh, be very in focus where the plane of focus is present at the pumpkins, especially that first pumpkin over there on the far left. That's the one that's in focus. Everything else is a little bit out of focus. So the main focal area is going to be that particular pumpkin. And I want to remember that as I progress through the piece. Just adding a few branches in here for that evergreen tree. I've got some leaves in the middle ground area on our ground cover and the grass in the far background. When I'm drawing grass, um, I need several different colors to make it look convincing. If I don't have several different colors, especially this grass up here near the front in the foreground, I'm not going to be able to make it look very convincing. I can't just use one static color and expect that to look like grass. But in the background, I'm going to have very horizontal strokes. In uh, this area up here in the front, I'm going to uh, make sure that I have uh, very uh, vertical strokes for the grass. But as, as the composition recesses and your eyes uh, move back towards the back, then I'm going to have more of a, a horizontal stroke back there because again there's going to be less detail and so I'm looking at abstract images and shifts in the color. Using glass scene to protect my drawing with my hand. I don't always remember to do that um, but <laughs> when I'm really thinking about it then I am going to use that. 
especially if there's a wet area, uh, it's not quite dry. I wouldn't go on, on top of it if it's entirely wet, but a little bit of dampness is okay. If I use that glassine, I keep it pretty static, set in one spot, then I should be okay. I need to uh, fill in all of this area for uh, the grass, add more information everywhere in the composition, and it's really just a back and forth. One of the beautiful things about color pencil is the ability that we have to float in and out of different areas of the composition. If I get bored or I get tired of one area, then I can just switch my focus to uh, maybe the sky. If I'm tired of the grass, go to the sky. If I'm tired of uh, working on a pumpkin, go to the grass. If I'm tired of working on a shadow, go to uh, the object that the shadow is casting. Tired of a form shadow? Go to uh, the trees in the background. There's so many different things that I can do. I can change up uh, my focus while I'm creating. That is a great advantage of working in colored pencil. Obviously, the cleanup, lack of cleanup, and uh, the lack of setup and all of that is another big advantage of using uh, professional-grade colored pencils. Coming in here on my second pumpkin, trying to get some of that contour and form. And I don't want to lose that uh, depth that I can create with having a, a very stark contrast between the shadow, the cast shadow from the first pumpkin, and the light hitting this second pumpkin. So some of the shadow, though, from the cast shadow on the second pumpkin and the form shadow start to uh, blend into one another. They start to look very similar. And that's not a bad thing, but I, I just have to be aware that there are two separate areas here that are within a shadowed area. And make sure that at least I know where those separations are, even if it isn't communicated directly to the viewer. I want to make sure most of that red area in the background on the form shadow over on the right side also is nearly the same value and color as the cast shadow. Using quite a bit more purple in the cast shadow for the third pumpkin, only because log logic would dictate that it's, um, it's far away, and uh, it's farther away than even the, you know, the first pumpkin, and so I can use... Um, a little deeper shadow back there. So that's logical, so I can, I can do that, whether I see that in my reference that I'm using or not. So I just have to keep going on this and increasing the value of these shadows. And if I do that and I stay focused... Uh, then I can create something that will appear to be three-dimensional and, and can uh, pop off the page just a little. Coming back in there with my lighter colors as well, that Polychromos Ivory color is just such a good one to use on this particular composition. Adding some texture to the stems. And if you use different colors on each of these pumpkins, you can vary uh, the look of each pumpkin. And that way they just don't look like clones of each other, but they look different enough. And they look like they belong together, but they're different enough that uh, you can look at them and, and tell that there are visual differences in each of these. They're unique. <laughs> Getting my shadows in there. And this this third pumpkin really is out of focus quite a bit. So I I do want to sort of capitalize on that and show that it's you know not not as in focus as certainly the first pumpkin over on the far left. I'm just increasing the dark shadow. Now I think about the way those shadows are working and the way that light would travel. Down in the uh, the far right side or left side rather, 
um, at the edge of where the pumpkins meet the, the other pumpkin, it's going to be darker down there. As we get close to the earth, the darkest area is going to be right there by the earth and uh, right there in the grass. The lightest area of the cast shadow is going to be up there where the cast shadow edge is and the light, the highlight is. So I have to think about those things logically. Using my little nub of a Derwent drawing Chinese white in here. Now I'm going to add a little bit of blue to part of the, sh uh, the form shadows. Maybe a little bit in the cast shadows of the pumpkins. Only because there seems to be a little bit of reflection of the sky in there. And even if I don't see that in my reference, I can always add that in. That's something that makes it a little more believable. Where I've got that reflective light coming back in there. And that blue, which would match a sky color, is very compelling, very convincing. I used a lot of the olive green by the Derwent drawing line. I've got to make sure I get all the grass in there and fully render out the rest of these objects over here, the other gourds that are in this composition. But I have to think about the cast shadow that all of these objects uh, are producing. So the gourds, the pumpkins themselves... There's a shadow uh, in the grass, and I don't want to ignore that. I want to make sure that I place that in here. So this entire project took uh, around seven hours. Uh, this is available in a course over in the Sharpened Artist Academy. If you're interested in uh, signing up for that and you get the full length version of this, it's not sped up at all, not uh, cut out either. I don't... Uh, chop out any of the key parts. Uh, I don't chop out any of it, actually. I show you every single thing. Multiple camera angles, downloadable uh, instructions, booklet and workbook that you can work from, online interaction with other students inside the academy as well. You can share your work over there. And it's just, it's a whole lot of fun if you want to take this to the next level. So I'm just going to use some of my darker colors um, over here in the grass and gradually, slowly increase the shadows. I'm going to finish filling in all of the ground cover in the background. By the time I'm done, I don't really want there to be any white anywhere in this piece. I don't, I don't want that big of a range for this piece. I don't want a value range that is quite that drastic. And so I want to mute down uh, even this white-looking gourd right here in front. I want to make sure that it doesn't become an eyesore and that it is uh, lighter than everything else. But I, I still want it to have sort of that ivory kind of look, this uh, sort of an eggshell sort of color. I don't want it to be pure white. Got to get these leaves rendered out. You know, I'm thinking about dead leaves, uh, fall kind of winter kind of leaves that uh, once had some beautiful vibrant colors but now have dried out and they're dying they're dead and they're out of focus most of them as well so i don't have to add a whole lot of detail to them but i want the colors to be a very muted neutral tone all right we're getting close to being done with this and and actually i didn't cut out anything in this composition in this particular drawing I just sped it up uh, extremely fast so that you could see everything that was completed in this project. Getting towards the end of the piece, I just want to think about the value separations and if I've created enough 
variation in the shadows and in the highlights and enough contrast everywhere and then I'm going to look at it from across the room sign it if you're doing this yourself sign it maybe uh, date it as well and I hope you had fun drawing this I had a lot of fun drawing it myself it's so fast working on pastel mat it offers you uh, some speed that you just can't get on a lot of other drawing surfaces because of some of those properties of being able to move the pigment around with solvent as much as I did. I used, um, I used Gamsel by Gamblin and the ability to go uh, in a light direction over dark colors is another advantage that I had on this surface, sped up the process quite a bit. So I got to carve out a little spot over on the far right with my battery operated eraser. I have the room over there to sign my name and then blow that off with my air rocket. Use my brush and get rid of any debris that may be on the surface. Let it dry completely. It dries very fast once you uh, add a little bit of solvent here and there. Um, but make sure it's dried completely and Call it done. Call it finished. All right. I hope you enjoyed that. I've also got uh, a uh, two-hour version of this over in the monthly sharpener in the members circle area over there. Just a few dollars a month gets you in there and access to so many benefits, and this is one of them. Thank you so much for watching. Stay sharp.